Good morning. morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. My name is Tony Fisher. I'm the minister here. Whether you're here for the first time or the second or the 152nd, you are very welcome this morning. We're glad to have you with us. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples is a welcoming congregation, freely seeking intellectual and spiritual growth, We strive to build a wider community of peace, justice, and love. Each of us is encouraged to grow spiritually in fellowship with others by joining in worship, in educational opportunities, in celebration, in reflection, and discussion. We try to do all this in the spirit of acceptance and love and the commitment to one another to offer mutual support in times of need. We invite you all, especially those of you who are here for the first time, to join us after the service for uh, refreshments and conversation. It will spill out onto the patio, and I suspect out into the front yard and and, uh, all around. I'd like to uh, point you to a couple of important things in the uh, order of service. First, you have your Sunday news. Actually, Jim, if I can borrow yours. You have your blue Sunday news, and there's lots of things going on in the congregation. I specifically want you uh, to have your attention focused on the 2020 task force, which will have its second feedback session today after the service in Thomas Hall, which is down this hall. We're doing a visioning process here at the uh, UUCGN, as we call it, and um, we're hoping that everyone will participate in helping us form a vision for the year 2020 and what, what we would like to be as a congregation in five years. Um, I'd also like to uh, um, welcome our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Jim Kenney is co-founder of Common Ground in Chicago. He did his doctoral work in the history and literature of religions at Northwestern University, and he has served as the executive director of Common Ground in Chicago since 1986. Uh, We welcome, I know some of you have had the opportunity to hear uh, Jim already this morning, and we're all looking forward to uh, hearing him again on a different subject in a few minutes. Uh, I was spending the morning with the coming-of-age program here at the congregation and enjoying my conversation with the youth and talking about uh, what they're up to and what they're thinking about, and um, they were preparing, they are preparing for a service at the end of April, so we hope you'll put that on your calendar. Uh, Also in your order of service, you'll note that there's uh, an upcoming fundraiser at the end of March. It's a big big fundraiser for the congregation. I urge you to look at that. And let's see, I got too many papers up here. Jim is speaking again on Tuesday in a workshop um, at uh, 11, 10 o'clock to 11.30, and also again on Wednesday evening at our, at our, our forum, our Common Voices, Progressive Voices Speak Out series on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, and again on Thursday there's another workshop that you can attend. So all of that is in your order of service, so we hope you do that. I will tell you, uh, those of you who are hard of hearing, that there's usually uh, a printed uh, version of the sermon, uh, but Jim speaks pretty much extemporaneously, so there is not a printed version of the sermon this morning, um, which I only aspire to do. Uh, But if you are hard of hearing and would like uh, additional assistance, there are some devices that, that can be brought to you. We also have large print versions, if your sight is a little bit impaired, of the hymnal. So uh, if you need something, just feel free to go back and speak to the uh, ushers or raise your hand. And now I would like you to silence your electronic devices, make sure they're silent, as we enter in a time of worship.
Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. Let's join together this morning in our opening hymn number 40 in the gray hymnal, The Morning Hangs a Signal. Please... Please rise as you're willing and able. Please be seated. We gather this hour as a people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light our chalice each Sunday, beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in the celebration of this life we share together. Please join me in the response that's printed in your order of service. Each morning, This is a time in our service where we have an opportunity to share with one another the joys and sorrows that we carry with us every day of the week, each moment of each day. If you have a joy or a sorrow that you'd like to share this morning, I urge you to raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you, and if you would state your name and share briefly what's in your heart. So we hold all these joys that have been spoken and all the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts and have been left unspoken this morning. We hold them together as community. Let's sing together number 352 in your gray hymnals. Find a stillness as we deepen into a time of meditation.
please join me in the spirit of meditation. When asked, what actions are most excellent? The prophet Muhammad said, to gladden the heart of a human being, to feed the hungry, to help the afflicted, to lighten the sorrow of the sorrowful, to remove the wrongs of the injured. Let us not forget. When asked, who is fit to hold power and worthy to act in God's place? The psalmist responded, Those with a passion for truth, who are horrified by injustice, who act with mercy for the poor, and take up the cause of the helpless, who have let go of selfish concerns and see the whole of creation as sacred. Let us not forget. When asked, what are the greatest commandments? Jesus, carpenter of Nazareth, answered, to love your creator, to love your neighbor, to undermine oppressive powers with life-giving actions, to be in solidarity with all who suffer, to act for justice, and teach others to act in the same way. Let us not forget. Spirit of love, we know that at times we have fallen short from living out the call to justice our sacred stories place upon us. So help us instead to be guided by the highest estimate of the worth and dignity of every person. And may we recommit to a life where we bend our words and actions towards justice. May it be so. Amen.
Responsive reading this morning is number 557 in your gray hymnals. A Common Destiny. All living substance, all substance of energy, being, and purpose are united and share the same destiny. Birth to death, we share this unity with the sun, earth, flowers of the field, snowflakes, volcanoes, and moonbeams. Our destiny from unknown to unknown. This Sunday, we have a split the plate Sunday, and I am without my script. Is Steve here? Okay, hold on a sec. Uh, So I am blanking completely. Friends of foster children, thank you. So what we do every, every third week of every month is uh, we take our an- usual uh, collection for the congregation, but we split that, the, the uh, take of that collection and we share it with a charity that changes every month. So I hope that you will... Would you like to come up and say a little bit about the Friends of This is my wife, Anne, who comes to me always in support. <laughs> um, oh, here's Suzanne, who knows much more about it than I do. Great. Thanks. So, friends, I'm Suzanne Miners Levy. I rushed up to the front. <laughs> um, I'm a, I've been on the board of directors, and the, I am in the vice chair of the board of Friends of Foster Children. We are a local nonprofit that tries to show every child, despite whether or not they have a stable familial situation, that they deserve to have their dreams answered. They deserve to have the opportunity to develop skills and talents through summer camps, through lessons, and to have educational support in the schools. So we provide educational mentorship by trained teachers that work one-on-one with the kids. Even as they age out of foster care, they help transition them back into their home, or towards college, and that kind of professional one-on-one support, it goes directly to children in Collier County, or what's happening right now is kids in Collier County are getting placed in Lee and Henry County because we don't have enough foster homes. And so we can follow those services to Lee and Henry County and try to get the kids back home, but regardless of whether, where or where they end up, even if the state isn't providing whatever services they're supposed to provide, we as an independent nonprofit make sure that they have the tools they need to be successful. Suzanne Miners Levy, and so much better than if I had said it myself. <laughs> so the morning's offering will be gratefully received.
This is the reading for today. It comes from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who says that spirituality, not religion, is preeminent. But still, it's important to realize that he represents the very best of religion as the wellspring of spirituality. So listen in that regard. He says, I believe that if someone really wants a happy life, then it's very important to pursue both material development and mental development. One could also say spiritual development, but when I say spiritual, I do not necessarily mean any kind of religious faith. I mean basic human good qualities, human affection, uh, a sense of involvement, honesty, discipline, and human intelligence properly guided by good motivation. We all have all of these things from birth. They do not come to us later in our lives. Religious faith, however, does come later. And then the Dalai Lama elucidates a few important distinctions between religion and spirituality, and he says, religion is concerned with faith in the claims of salvation, an aspect of which is acceptance of some form of metaphysical or supernatural reality. Connected with this are religious teachings or dogma, ritual, prayer, and so on. That's the religion side. Spirituality, he says, is concerned with inner qualities of the human spirit, such as love and compassion, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, uh, contentment, a sense of responsibility, a sense of harmony, all of which bring happiness both to self and to others. These qualities involve an implicit concern for others' well-being and can be developed to a high degree without recourse to any religious or metaphysical belief system. So... That pretty much says it all, so just talk amongst yourselves, I think. Um, now, this, this um, presentation uh, in your flyers and things that you've seen was called spiritual, or spirituality but not religion, or spiritual but not religious. Uh, but after a conversation with, with Tony, uh, uh, he agreed to put in the question mark that is in your order of service, because that's very important. My title was spirituality, or spiritual, but not religious, question mark. Uh, so, timer. I'm, <laughs> I'm nothing if not undisciplined. Uh, <laughs> so, let me say, this term, spiritual but not religious, has become so common as an answer to the question, the pollster's question. So who are you? What's your belief system? Where do you come from? Uh, uh, what's your, uh, to what tradition do you belong? And so on. That now pollsters include it regularly. People like the Pew Foundation regularly include that in their questionnaires and, and so on. What, from what tradition do you hail? Well, I'm actually spiritual but not religious. So now it has in the literature, in the sociological literature, and literature, the study of religion, we just refer to it as SBNR. And everybody, everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. So you're SBNR, SBNR. Uh, anybody that walks into a college class, Religion 101, is all set for SBNR. Uh, and it, what's interesting is that as you pursue that discussion with your college students, Uh, what you find is that they think pretty much saying I'm spiritual but not religious covers it all. You know, that they are not required ever to have another thought. (laughs) Which is so often the case (laughs) in college. Um, But here's here's the very interesting data. According to a 2012 survey by the Pew, uh, PEW, Religion and Public Life Project, by the way, if you're interested in data and studies on religion and how it fits in public life in America and Europe and so on, you can't beat Pew. They are fabulous researchers, and boy, their their data just does cover the waterfront. It's quite amazing. So in a 2012 survey on religion and public life, uh, nearly one-fifth of those polled said they were not religiously affiliated. Now, in the poll, the way it was reported, that was the big news. That's 20% of those who were polled who said they were not religiously affiliated. The fastest growing, to use the sociological term, the fastest growing cadre uh, uh, out there uh, when we ask the question, what's your religious identity, 
is uh, the group that we now call nuns. You got to spell it carefully. <laughs> there is not a significant growth in the population of, of nuns, but there is a significant growth in the population of nuns, N O N E S. What's your religious affiliation? None, thank you. Uh, 20% of those polls. Now, you understand this is only one poll, but we have a lot of data. A, a recent book, uh, three years now, by uh, Putnam and Campbell, two of the top sociologists of, of religion and uh, values in America, uh, revealed the same sort of thing, that the top, the number one uh, fastest growing cadre, as Casey Kasem would have said, number one with a bullet, is uh, nuns, right? And here's another interesting thing. If we say, where are these nuns coming from? You know, what is their family background? A good guess would be Jewish, right? For those who say, I have no religious affiliation. Another very good guess would be Roman Catholic, right? Because young people do tend to move away or move out of, or at least that's the anecdotal folkloric evidence, It's not true. The number one group from which, in other words, parental, religious, whatever, from which these new nuns, and it's really growing fast in the 18 to 30-year-old population, most of these kids, a significant majority, about 40%, come from evangelical and fundamentalist families, which is quite shocking, Uh, especially to evangelical and fundamentalist (laughs) families. Now, of those, now we're just talking about the 20% of the population, the 20% of the population that say, in answer to the question, what's your religious affiliation? I'm a nun, right? Uh, About 37% of those, for a total, let's make this easy, of about 7% of the population in general. That's the group that says spiritual but not religious. Now, we're very interested in that, because if you say none, my religious identity is none, does that mean you have no longer any interest in anything spiritual, in anything that religion ever talked about? And a surprising fraction say, no, no, we still have active spiritual lives, we're spiritual but not religious. So we're talking about at least 7% of the population, most of the people who study this think it's significantly larger, but people get squeamish about reporting religious and spiritual doubt. So when the pollster approaches, our belief in God climbs, <laughs> our belief in angels goes way up. Interestingly enough, our belief in astrology also goes up. So, uh, uh, but something like at least 7% of the population would identify as spiritual uh, but not religious. Just to put that in perspective, that's more than the, uh, in the United States. This is, that's larger than the population of Jews in the U.S. That's more than the population of Muslims in the U.S. And just to put it in perspective, that's more than we have Episcopalians, right? The spiritual but not religious. But I want to, I wanna, because I put a question mark at the beginning there. So spiritual but not religious question mark. I want to suggest that none of this data suggests that all SBNRs, spiritual but not religious people, have a mature grasp of the potential of real spirituality or the hard work that it requires. You know, I think for a lot of people that say, look, I'm SBNR, that just means, you know, I'm content I'm done. I'm done with my religious slash spiritual work. I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. Get off my case. Uh, So uh, I want to first ask, well, what do we mean by religious and what do we mean by spiritual? We could go on and on about this all day long. Uh, We're not going to. I I know that's a relief to you. Uh, (laughs) But let me tell you this. Religion is cultural. Religion helps, me to, I, uh, helps to identify me in relation to the group. I wear my religion in a way analogous to the way I wear my ethnicity or my field of study uh, and so on. It helps to identify me with respect uh, to the group. Religion comes with uh, a certain set of identifiers. Uh, uh, My religious identity, whatever religious identity I might claim, whether I'm a UU or a Roman Catholic or whatever. I'm always thrilled when I talk about religion to a UU group and without fail, although I think my having said this just now will prevent it from happening today. uh, But someone comes up to me and says, well, you know, we don't have religion here. (laughs) Well, what do you think this is? 
chess club? Uh, no, and I, I remember a woman saying, you know, the UU uh, church has never had anything at all to do with the question of God. Nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, why do you suppose you're Unitarians? Because you didn't want to be Trinitarians. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm not here to argue about that. Uh, so whatever your religious I- identity is, whether it's you, you, or Roman Catholic, or Muslim, or Hindu, or, or Zoroastrian, or Native American, whatever it happens to be, it comes with an origin story. Here's how I think we got here. And it comes with a set of, of at least basic beliefs. It usually comes with a set of highly recommended behaviors. Uh, and sometimes it might, it might come with a set of, of reinforcements for uh, you know, cultivating the, that highly recommended set of, of behaviors. But religion, think about this. Religion has more to do with my identity, which is how I appear to others and how I interact with others. All well and good. Spirituality has more to do with self, with uh, you know, who I am, who I am actually becoming. Uh, I would want to go out on a limb and say that spirituality is the animating heart of religion when it works. Uh, I remember giving a talk um, years ago. Actually, it's interesting because many of you remember my partner and colleague and teacher, Ron Miller. And uh, one of us gave this talk. We told the story so often that we couldn't remember which one gave the talk. But one of us gave the talk, and it was in a, a Protestant uh, parish, liberal Protestant parish. And afterwards, the, the pastor or the curate or somebody came up and said, that's very interesting. You talked a lot about spirituality. And I said, I said, or Ron said, yes. And he said, hmm, we don't have that. <laughs> to which, whichever of us thought, I bet your congregation wishes you did. Uh, so... What do I mean by spirituality? Uh, spirituality is the, the belief that the human experience is perhaps not terminal. You know, that the human experience might be open-ended, that I can be broadened or deepened. I can grow in understanding and compassion and insight. Uh, many spiritual traditions would argue very strongly, including the tradition of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. But I think most would argue that it's possible uh, with a cultivation of, of a spiritual life to expand one's consciousness, to deepen one's consciousness, and, and so on. So... Here's what I'd, I'd like to uh, suggest. Do you understand what I mean? Religion, identity side, perfectly valid thing to do, uh, spirituality, uh, self side. First question is, is it possible to be very, very religious and not spiritual at all? Yeah, you really want to say yes to this one big time. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for a list of people you know who fit that. But you know you're all thinking of them. You know, people who are so religious and have never had a spiritual moment. Uh, Many of them have television shows uh, about religion. Uh, Is it possible to be spiritual but not religious? And I don't just mean SBNR, you know, which is a kind of throwaway line, but deeply spiritual, profoundly spiritual, have an active spiritual life, be growing, struggling, working, consuming energy and resources and, and searching and see. You're nodding, so we at least agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, is it without being religious? And I want to say, oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, is there, does it mean anything to suggest that maybe the ideal might be to have a rich spiritual life that is nurtured by access to a rich religious tradition. So over the years, I've searched for a... I'm always searching for metaphors, uh, uh, but search for a metaphor that might work, might help uh, to understand this, to teach this a little bit better, to understand it better in my own life. And finally, it occurred to me that the relationship between religion, the sort of identity, and, and the formalistic stuff... Right? And I don't, I'm trying to talk about religion in a way that is never dismissive. I regard it as of supreme, potentially of supreme value. Let me interrupt myself right now and say that this might have been another talk, which I think I might have given down here at some point. I often talk about religion in terms of its many faces. And I talk about the good, 
the bad, the ugly, and the best. So is there an ugly, a supremely ugly face of religion? Yeah, we were talking about it this morning when we talked about ISIS and Boko Haram. Uh, Is there a sort of bad face of religion? Yeah, as soon as religion becomes inflexible, and I'm just going to say it, fundamentalist, religion has already started to sour uh, when it begins to lock in its teachings and to lock in its, its certainty and that kind of thing. Uh, you don't want to encounter uh, um, a musical fundamentalist you know, who says there's been no real music since Beethoven, <laughs> although clearly not since the Beatles, but, um, <laughs> but, or a culinary fundamentalist. You understand that's always, fundamentalism is always a narrowing of thought. It, your conversation begins to go south, right? So religion at its best is, it seems to me, it's the, it's the quality of life and exchange and interaction and, and, and camaraderie and shared understanding that you would find in a healthy village, right? Or a healthy family, right? That's religion when it's good. When religion gets taken over for purposes that are no longer spiritual at all or religious at all, but rather political or power-based and so on, that's when we begin to harden our doctrine uh, and and turn toward fundamentalism. When religion decides that that those who are outside of our little fundamentalist enclave deserve nothing but our violence and opprobrium, that's ugly. But So what's religion at its best? Well, I'm going to wind up with that, but I'll give you the suggestion right now. It seems to me that we're beginning to experience religion at its best in this remarkably cultural evolutionary age in which we live. I know it sometimes seems rather depressing, and we all think we're going downhill or to hell. Those of you who know me know that I absolutely believe that we're living in an age of dramatically accelerated cultural evolution. Not our institutions, but our values. I hear people often who will say, I I understand, I read your book, or I understand your argument about values evolution, but then I look at the Catholic Church, or then I look at the government, or then I look at the Congress, and my response is always, boy, are you looking in the wrong places, (laughs) right? First, values change, then behavior changes, and then maybe one day evolutions are dragged, I mean, institutions are dragged along. But when religion moves as as is its natural path from good you know, life-sustaining, benevolent, beneficent, toward best, what's happening is that it's moving toward the embrace of other religious traditions. Uh, Religion is moving toward what I'm going to end with, with just a teaser, uh, inter-spirituality. So let me give you my metaphor before I wind up. And that is this, that it seems to me the relationship between religion and spirituality is precisely analogous I don't think there are precise analogies, but it's pretty darned analogous to the relationship between museum culture and art. Think about it. What is museum culture at its best? What does it support and sustain and nurture and evoke and, and so on? Art and the artistic experience. Do you know anybody who's deeply, in, or can you imagine someone deeply involved in museum culture on several boards who's never had an art moment, right? who doesn't know, as it says in the Talmud, who doesn't know from art? <laughs> uh, it does. Uh, and is it possible for someone to be profoundly artistic who's never been inside a museum? If you met that person, what would you want to do? Wouldn't you want to take her by the hand and take her to a fabulous museum? To introduce her to the treasures that are, that museums, uh, for which museums serve as the repository. The the record, the living record uh, of of other struggling um, artistic geniuses who have, have told us a little bit about where they went and what it was like and, and wh- how we might follow in their footsteps. So just as a person can be profoundly artistic and just completely unmuseumed, and a person can be, you know, completely museumed and have no clue uh, about art, I'm, I'm not sure that group is rescuable. I don't spend a lot of time with them, but, but the, 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 the artistic potential, budding genius or seeker, right, who's never been inside a treasure house, 
I want to do something about that. And I think that that's what, when religion gets it right, what it's doing is consciously trying to cultivate, deepen, broaden uh, the spiritual experience of at least some of its adherents. I remember Ron Miller saying to me years ago, if you go to a, a new congregation, you want to sign up, you want to join the congregation, no one ever asks you, what are your spiritual dreams? And you never ask, what's the first year going to be like? You know, it's just like, okay, how much will this cost me, and what do we do, and what happens on, on whatever is the day? Uh, so at, at their very best, religion and spirituality come together. I love the idea of spiritual but not religious, because I think most of the people that will hold that up as their new identity are trying to reject, are trying to make a statement about rejecting the bad and the ugly side of religion. When they say, I'm spiritual but not religious, they want to say, I'm not one of those, right? Uh, but I, anyway, let me end with some words from a very, very close friend of, of mine, and mine and Seta's, uh, known to many of you, Brother Wayne Teasdale, uh, who passed away in 2004, uh, one of the great minds of our time. And he says, being religious connotes belonging to and practicing a religious tradition. Being spiritual suggests a personal commitment to a process of inner development that engages us in our totality. And he says, he talks about interspirituality. It's a term he coined in his last book, The Mystic Heart, The Mystic Heart, published in 2004, the year he died. Interspirituality is focused on the recovery of the shared mystic heart beating in the center of the world's great in the center of the world's deepest spiritual traditions the sharing of ultimate experiences across traditions interspiritual dialogue can underpin a new kind of interreligious dialogue i think of the conversation between someone like thomas merton and his holiness the dalai lama uh, when ne neither was trying to convince the other to adopt his particular theology, the Dalai Lama never once asked Thomas Merton if it was true that he believed in God. And Thomas Merton never asked the Dalai Lama if it was true that he didn't. Instead, they ended up talking about a, a common experience, which was that each one had served as a teacher of young monks, as a novice master, a teacher of young monks, and how do you bring them into an awareness of their spirituality. For each of these, one Roman Catholic, one Buddhist, uh, the most important thing was that you awaken the spirituality. The Dalai Lama thought that Buddhism had a perfectly adequate set of tools. Thomas Merton was convinced that Roman, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism had a delightful set of tools, but what they're really after is waking up at least one or two of these baby monks. <laughs> and uh, we're all baby monks. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. We get to stand now and join our voices once again and sing our final hymn, number 295, Sing Out Praises for the Journey.
Next week, here in the sanctuary, the Reverend, Re Reverend Richard Gilbert will give a service. Richard is a retired Unitarian Universalist minister from Rochester, New York, one of my heroes, and I urge you to come and listen to his words. The closing words this morning come from Unitarian Transcendentalist Theodore Parker. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. Please be seated for the postlude.